The narcissist codependent relationship creates a toxic solitude that never goes away and only increases. The more you try and relieve the solitude, the worse it gets. Today we're going to talk about the myth of Narcissus and Echo. I don't know if you're familiar with the entire myth. I myself had not been um, aware of the entire myth around Narcissus. So as you know, Narcissus, uh, you know, everybody knows probably just the basics of it is Narcissus was a very beautiful hunter who was not interested in anybody else. And uh, he, when he got lost in the woods, he looked into a pond and he saw uh, his reflection. He fell in love with the reflection. And because it was just a reflection on the water, he was unable to actually touch it and connect with it. And so he died mourning over this beautiful creature that he could not connect with. And then after he died, he turned into a flower, which is the Narcissus flower. But what I didn't know, surprisingly enough, is that there is an actual, not just a myth about how the narcissist never, you know, gets over their own narcissistic reflection, but that there's a whole mythology, a whole story connecting the codependent victim. And so the story is actually the story of Narcissus and Echo. But actually, there's a couple other uh, characters in there as well. There, there's Zeus, and there's his wife Hera, and a few other nymphs. So let me tell you the whole myth, because it's absolutely beautiful, and you have to know all of the details to know that, you know, our ancestors, when they created these myths, they were delving into some incredibly deep wisdom. And the myth, the entire myth, actually really does explain exactly what's going on in the most beautiful way. So we're going to delve into that. All right, so here's the deal. So uh, on this mountain, I forget the name of this mountain um, that is still in Greece. It's a mountain in Greece. And on this mountain, um, there were some nature nymphs, some sexy little um, female spirits running around through the forest frolicking. And Zeus, when he came down to earth, he liked to experience the fleshly pleasures of both uh, human women and, of course, things like nature nymphs. So he, this was probably one of his most favorite spots that he went to. So he went to this mountain. All of these nymphs were there, and he would indulge his lustful fantasies with uh, these nymphs. But he had his wife, Hera, who on Mount Olympus with her psychic powers, she knew. She knew what Zeus was doing. So what Zeus did is he flew down there and all of the nymphs, of course, gathered around him. And one of the nymphs was named Echo. And Echo was a beautiful nymph who also had a gift of speech. And she had the ability, being a magical nymph that she was, she had this ability to seduce you into these beautiful stories. And she could just talk her way in and out of anything, but she was really prideful of her ability to communicate and communicate and create these amazing stories. And so Zeus flies down there and he, he, all the nymphs gather around and he says to Echo, he says, Echo, I need you to do me a favor. I need you to go to my wife, Hera, and I need you to spin a tale that will get her so distracted that I can indulge my lusts with the other nymphs. Nymphs, And so because she was so proud of her ability to create stories and because, I mean, you know, Zeus had told her to do it, she can't really say no, can she? So she uh, flies on over to Mount Olympus where Hera is and she flutters into... Um, Hera's bedroom and Hera says, what are you doing here? And she says, I love you, Hera, and I want to tell you a beautiful story. Would you like to hear it? And Hera says, well, if you can tell me a story that will get me out of my boredom and entertain me, 
I'll listen to it to the end if it's good enough. And Echo, being proud of her abilities, launched into this beautiful story that went on and on and on and on and on. And Hera really got into it and enjoyed it. And then at the end of the story, Hera starts to get suspicious. And with her psychic abilities, she becomes aware that Zeus is, in fact, doing the nasty with other nymphs and that this knew exactly what was going on, that Zeus told her to come and do this. So she was furious. So what she did was she cursed Echo. She cursed Echo that Echo would never be able to speak her own truth from within herself. But if she, if she did speak, it would only be as a result of somebody speaking to her. And even then, she would only be able to say the last few words that were spoken to her by somebody else. It's the worst thing that could have been done to Echo. Now, now we bring in the character of Narcissus. So Narcissus is on the same mountain sometime after all of this. And he gets lost. He's in a hunting party and he gets lost. And uh, so Echo sees him and she falls madly in love with him. Now, Narcissus had also been cursed. He had been cursed before birth. I can't remember why something his mom did. But he was uh, cursed before birth that he would never know who he was. Isn't that brilliant? He would never be able to know who he was. So as a result, he was incredibly beautiful. I think he was this, I think he was half nymph, so he was already just like incredibly beautiful. And everybody that saw him, masculine, feminine, no matter, when they locked eyes on him, they all fell in love with him. But because he didn't know who he was, he was incapable of loving them back. And so he just broke hearts everywhere he went. He wanted nothing to do with anybody. Nobody was good enough for him. You get the lesson there. If you can't love yourself, you can't love anybody else. It's not possible. So he gets lost and the nymph Echo sees him and falls madly in love with him. And she is shy. She normally, what she would do is she, if she wanted you, she would be able to come up to you and she would be able to seduce you with beautiful words. You wouldn't be able to not listen to her. Probably would have been a match made in heaven, but she wasn't able to do that. So she was so insecure. All she did was follow him around, looking at him lovingly, yearning for him. And so he's lost and he starts yelling out, hey, and Echo can only repeat what you've said. So she'd go, hey. And so he'd go, hello. She'd go, hello. So he starts this conversation. He says, who's there? She says, who's there? He says, it, I'm Narcissus. I'm close by. She says, I'm close by. So you can see what's going on. He thinks that he's talking to somebody that's guiding him to safety. So he follows the voice. And so she's trying to stay out of sight, you know, and he's getting very frustrated because, you know, he's calling out and she's responding the last few words that he says. And he thinks that he's finding, gonna get, gonna get saved. And so she actually, before she can hide, she catches a glimpse of him. <gasps> And she's just locked in absolute love for him. And she can't move. And he sees her. So he talks to her. He says, who are you? She says, who are you? And so then it becomes like that game between kids, you know. Uh, you know, somebody just repeating somebody. So he gets angry. He says, you're just mocking me. She says, you're just mocking me. And she can't tell him anything. She can't spin this good story and she can't tell him her honest feelings. She can't help him. She can't do anything. She can only repeat what he says, the last few words. And so in desperation to try and connect with him, she grabs onto him and he gets furious at this and he throws her off. And he says, 
what in the world makes you think that I love you? To which she responds, I love you. And he says, don't come anywhere near me. I want to be alone. She says, I want to be alone. She's just, it's just this horrible scenario. So he's lost and she can't connect with him. She keeps following him. So he's, he's going through the woods, lost in the woods, and he finds this pond and he looks into the pond and he sees his reflection. <gasps> For the first time, he sees the one being that's worthy of his love. Who is it? Himself. Why is he in love with himself? Because he was cursed to never know who he truly was. So he sees his own reflection and he falls in love with the reflection. And here's where it gets really, you thought it was sad before. It's going to get even sadder. So he looks at the reflection. He tries to touch the person that goes away. He moves back. He oh, it comes back to him again. The, the vision of him comes back. And all he can do is get close, but he can't touch it. And so he starts talking to this mirror image that's looking up at him lovingly and saying the same things he's saying. So he'll say, you're beautiful. And Echo says, you're beautiful. <gasps> he thinks that the, the vision he's looking at is talking back to him. He says, I think you're the most amazing creature on earth. You're the most amazing creature on earth. I love you. I love you. And so here Echo can't help but say what Narcissus is narcissistically trying to say to himself as he creates this illusion, this fantasy of being in love with nothing. <laughs> Do you see how, that, how brilliant this is? This is the... This is the codependent narcissistic relationship. And you see uh, in the picture here, you see Echo there. She's wanting to talk to him. She's talking to him, but he can't see her. He can only see himself. But he hears his own words being spoken back to him, and he thinks it's his reflection talking to him. He's not even aware that she's there anymore by this time. And so because of he can't connect and it creates a deeper yearning the more he looks at his own image the more in love he becomes with it the more in love it, the image looks at him with love the more he falls in love and it just increases and increases and increases and all he does is he sits there and weeps as he looks at this beautiful being that he can't touch he can't connect with I mean, he goes to kiss it and it goes to kiss him and then it falls apart. And Echo feels so bad for him because she's all alone and she doesn't have a voice. And she's all she can do is repeat back his love for himself. And that, of course, makes it worse for him. So eventually he, uh, he starves to death and dies. And as he's dead uh, on there on the shore, you know, trying, you know, died looking at himself, she is sitting there mourning his body and she's stroking his hair and crying over him. And uh, then what happens is that he turns into a flower. Her weeping, uh, you know, waters, you know, his corpse, which turns into flowers, the Narcissus flower. And she withers away into nothing, except she is the voice, the echo that exists in lonely places, in mountains, in caves. And to this day, anybody who speaks loudly enough in those places, she can only respond by saying whatever it is that you've said. Hello, hello, I'm here, I'm here. Very sad. So what does all of this mean? I mean, it's pretty obvious, a lot of it. But what I found most interesting was that Narcissus was cursed to never know himself, meaning he has no, he has no identity. 
He has no identity. Which is, of course, why he can't love anybody. He can't love anybody because you can't love somebody else if you don't know who you are. If you don't know who you are, you can never see anybody else as having an identity. What does that mean? You have no empathy. Narcissistic people have no empathy because there's no self. There's nobody home. And they desperately want to know who they are. And they hope that you will help them. And so the only relationship that can ever be had with the narcissist is with an echo. Somebody who can only speak to the narcissistic self-love of the narcissist. If the echo responds, if, if the narcissist becomes aware that echo is there, the narcissist will say horrible things. You suck, to which echo will have to say, you suck. Narcissist will say, I hate you. Echo will say, I hate you. That won't work. The relationship won't work if Echo reflects the negative, the actual feelings that the narcissist has for themselves, which is pure self-hatred. If you reflect any of that back to them, he will discard you. He will keep you around as long as you repeat back to him the the narcissistic love that he has for the identity he can never find. And what ends up happening? Nobody exists. Everybody fades away into nothing. And the lesson of that is how hopeless these relationships are. And in my book here, I, I talk about that. And it's the first step to recovering. You must realize there is no hope. There won't come a time when Echo says the, the one thing that makes Narcissus wake up and go, oh my God, you're here and you love me and you're available and you, I see myself in you. Nope, it'll never happen. That, that perfect thing that you could say to the love-struck, empty narcissist, there's nothing you can ever say, ever, that will make them happy and make them love you. Now, echo is a good codependent. Remember what the definition of codependence is. Codependence is when you get your value, your worth, outside of yourself. Where did Echo's codependence first reveal itself? When Zeus came to her and said, I want you to go and distract my wife while I cheat on her with a bunch of nymphs. Echo had to throw her boundaries away. Why? So she would be accepted by Zeus because if she said, Zeus, I can't do that. That goes against my principles. Lightning bolt to the head, end of Echo. If Echo said, I can't do that. I don't want to hurt Hera. Then at the very least, you're going to have Zeus not want to come and make love to you. At the, at the very least. At worst, if he doesn't kill you, he's going to hate you. And then you're going to be responsible when he comes to you and he says, my wife Hera is making my life a living hell and it's your fault. So it's a very difficult situation for Echo. So she responds out of her codependent need to be seen as this wonderful storyteller. So she distracts herself as she's throwing away her integrity, her boundaries, and goes and knowingly seduces somebody else's wife to, uh, to be distracted so that she can uh, aid and abet Zeus cheating on her. There is nothing about that that isn't codependent. She gets her value based on like me because I'm a good storyteller, not because she has a soul. Remember, here's what you need to know. I talk about this on my other channel a lot. There is nothing you can do ever, not one thing that you can ever do which will ever make you 
more lovable than you are simply because you exist. Babies are like this. Mothers love babies simply because they exist. You have a feeling, I love you. You poop your pants, I love you. You are mad at me, I love you. You love me, I love you. You're happy, I love you. You're sad, I love you. Babies learn that the only thing they need to do to be loved and approved of is simply to exist authentically, to have all of their feelings and experiences and express them. Now, of course, you have to grow up and learn how to, to do that internally. And that's what a healthy adult does. They do that internally instead of what the borderline and the narcissist do, which is have temper tantrums their whole life and make everybody's life miserable. So uh, the partner of the, the, uh, the narcissist continues to wound themselves in the hope that if I do something there's, which has nothing to do with me. Remember, Echo isn't, isn't saying any of her own words. If Narcissus looks at himself and says, I love you, she says, I love you. She, she can't help. She, it's not, none of it's coming from her. She's losing her authentic voice, her authentic self. She's an echo. She's, she's fake. She's nothing. It's miserable. It's horrible. All right. So you get uh, what this is all about. So the bottom line is this. This is a great understanding of how the narcissistic relationship will continue until there is nothing left. And then you will disappear into nothingness. Whatever is left of you will be a plant, a lifeless plant staring at the water. Or you will be a voice, a bodiless voice that has no thoughts of, of their own, that only lives in emptiness forever. It is hell. The only thing coming for you in this relationship is hell. There is cure to the narcissistic abuse pain that emptiness that gnaws away at you and gets deeper and deeper. There is a cure. In my experience, the vast majority of narcissistic abuse survivors never fully heal. And that is because they're not able to turn off the switch. I'm going to have to make a whole video about what the switch is, how it's set up, how it gets turned on, and how it can't be turned off except by doing the one thing. So if you know how to navigate a channel, go on my channel and look for the one thing and do it. You can also get my book, How I Survived My Borderline Girlfriend, and I tell you exactly what that one thing is. And my experience is, not only in my life, but every single person who has followed my advice, and I'm nothing special. I didn't make up the one thing. I'm just sharing it with you. Most people don't even know that it's a, a thing that you can do to cure yourself of narcissistic abuse pain. Um, it works. It works if you do it. So I uh, offer that to you. I hope that was helpful. I love this myth. I'm sure I will come back to it again and again. But feel free to go and read it yourself. The myth of Narcissus and Echo. That's it for me, guys. I will see you all next time.